All right, everybody. And we're going to be prompt for our folks online. I think we have about, we had scheduled about 40 people online. So a good crew there too. Welcome to Compass Financial. My name is Guy Lehman. I'm an owner and advisor here. And our, the roots of Compass Financial really go back to financial planning. We're going to talk about some aspects of that planning today. Um, Cause most people come into Compass with a big question on the tip of their tongue. And financial planning is really digging into that question and not only finding an answer, but finding an answer that, that's right for that person. And that's a big deal. Uh, we're also a registered investment advisor. And one of our big sayings is matching dollars with dreams. And it sounds a little corny until you've actually seen it in action and sit across from somebody and walk through the whole process of matching their dollars with their dreams. I do want to make the introductions. Uh, advisors, Steve Conard, Caleb Pearson, Justin Van Houten, Michelle, there you are, Mandy, let's see, did I get everybody? Alan, where's Alan? There he is. All right, our administrative sta staff is Julie Greer. Thanks, Julie. Nancy, Joe, there she is, Cheryl Hurst, and Hannah Mason. All right. Thanks for coming. I also want to introduce, uh, we, have, we have some unique visitors up here. These are, four, these are four Waukee Northwest students, and they have helped me with an AI, artificial intelligence project, we've been working on for about a semester now. They're getting ready for the end of the school year. I invited them to show a little bit about what we do here at Compass, so I want to thank them a lot for their help. And if you've got questions, AI questions for them, man, this is the group, all right? Okay. Uh, I do want to introduce Chris Winnen. Where's Chris? All right, in the back. He is from Invesco. He has been a longtime friend and resource for us here at Compass Financial. And he's talking about the new retirementality. He was here last year and we had such positive feedback, we decided to have him back and go over this, go over the same material because it's so rich and so deep. Chris, take it away. All right, can you all hear me all right? Okay, great. And this is perfect because these guys only have 60 years till retirement, right? So those are the folks that I get to look at for validation for the next two hours. Kidding, we'll, we'll be in and out here. And if there's some questions that come up and then we certainly want to interject, uh, let's do it. But uh, I'll introduce myself here first. I do live in Iowa. Uh, I'm uh, Invesco's representative for Iowa and Nebraska. Uh, my wife told me, she sent me her uh, IPERS math today. She said 19 years was her number. I told her it's a lot longer. We've got a one-year-old at home. Uh, so uh, we haven't done the whole financial planning, but maybe we'll have to schedule a meeting uh, when we walk out of here as well. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is this idea about the new retirementality. And I, I think this is important because retirement really is a little bit different for us than maybe what our parents went through, what our grandparents went through. And that's, that's an important, overwhelming theme for us to be talking about today, is that not to think of retirement as the end of the line, but rather an opportunity to fulfill the next chapter. And to have those conversations today, five years, 10 years, or 50 years before your retirement, so that we can have a more effective vision where those things are and ask the right questions. Now, I always find there's some benefit to being a little self-deprecating. So I'll tell one of my favorite stories about my wife. We've been together now for a long time. Uh, she's from Iowa. Uh, so I'm officially, she said I was promoted to captive um, once we had kids and, and little Iowa girls that are running around. Um, but when I met her, she's from Northern Iowa. I met her in Ames. And we, we were trying to do all the fun stuff back before COVID. You know, we would go bowling, we would go to a bar, we would do all the things for dates. And she saw in my apartment that I had golf clubs and she thought that that meant that I was a golfer. No, I just own golf clubs, right? But she said, we need to go golf sometimes, we need to go golf. So eventually I listened to her and we went out on the golf course. Um, I can't remember, Ada Hayden or one of those up there in Ames. Anyway, I go up on the first hole and I hit my 300 yard drive, right? It was 150 that way and 150 over there. My wife you know, makes us go up to the red tee. She goes and she hits one, literally 240 right dead down the middle of the fairway. And uh, I think her first words were, you're away. Uh, and, then the, <laughs> and then the second thing that she said is, uh, uh, I asked her, I said, you didn't tell me you were good at golf. And she said, well, you didn't ask. 
uh, the, the reality is that I married one of the most competitive human beings I've ever known, and she played golf in college, and it hadn't come up yet because she was kind of keeping that one as a secret. So the reason I tell you that story is that let's talk about some of those questions, right? Some of those questions that come up in retirement and some of the questions that, that we have found successful retirees have had as a thread, as a common core uh, in the conversations that they're there. So we're not going to talk a lot about the methodology like we do in investments. And Invesco is a huge investment firm. Uh, in fact, we run about $1.7 trillion, which I know these days and age, who knows what a billion or a trillion or a million is anymore. Uh, but it's a lot of money and it's spread out across a lot of different investment vehicles. Uh, a lot of times people know us from the QQQ commercials during basketball, if anybody watched Caitlin Clark uh, or uh, hopefully the Hawkeyes uh, or the Cyclones maybe make it a run here as well. Um, but uh, we do a lot of things on the investment side. My job is basically to be the uh, connection between our asset managers, our money managers, uh, and folks here in Iowa and Nebraska. And I really like that. I enjoy it a lot. Um, and we do a lot of really hardcore research when we're researching individual stocks. But the reality is, while we spend a lot of time trying to make sure that we can make our clients money, we do need to take a step back every once in a while and ask ourselves why we're doing all of this. So we're going to talk about three things here first. The first is, of course, what retire used to mean, what retire meant. And I alluded to that a little bit when we think about what our parents and grandparents went through, what we talk about when we talk about this idea of the new retire mentality, and then the three critical questions uh, that we should be asking uh, as we prepare for retirement here in general. So I'm going to start with this idea of what retirement meant. Uh, and uh, I think if this works out well, we should have this picture here. So I'm going to ask all of you, though, if I say the term traditional retirement, what do you think of? What, what are the, some words that kind of come to mind? Pension? Okay. What, anything else? 65. Great. That's a perfect answer. And the gold watch, right? And so I, I, I think I, I, I would have had one too many slides because you were going to be my perfect lead in and I was going to seem like I had planted somebody in the audience. Uh, but this is the traditional symbol for retirement, right? You work for 30, 40 years at a job and then you walk out with the gold watch. Now, I didn't do what I should have done watching in here, see how many people are still wearing traditional watches in this room, but every year it seems like it's less. I own a watch and then I end up wearing this thing that tells me when I'm having a heart attack, right? Uh, and, and maybe you guys are all doing something that's very, very similar. And the watch itself is kind of depressing. I mean, what does it symbolize? Is it how many years you've spent and you've given to an employer? Is it how much time we have left? Is it counting up? Is it counting down? And you know what, for you guys, if you work 30 years in any one of job, you know, that would be incredible. That's not really the economy or the world that we're living in anymore. So we do want to rethink this idea of what retirement meant. And, you know, one way that we could reframe that is instead of a gold watch, what if they handed out a compass? And I promise this is not just planted for you guys. Uh, but I think it's a really great image. And these guys got it right first to be able to talk about what that next destination is from a retirement standpoint. And, and the reality is all of the things fundamentally that we're taught from for retirement are kind of wrong, right? Retirement was never built to get successful people out of the workforce. Retirement was never built to get people to stop making contributions. Retirement, well... Retirement, a lot of it can be this guy right here. Um, now, if you haven't heard me talk before, does anybody know who this is? the different disparate states in Germany together to form a unified government. Um, and uh, he had opposition to that. I mean, you'd had the people from Munster, or Bavaria, or Hamburger. I'm trying to run out of foods here pretty quickly, but you get the idea uh, that, that, that we're all going to come together. And he had this common goal that he wanted um, to have a unified nation. But the old guard was very resistant. So how do you get politicians to do what you want? You give them what? Money, right? So that was the takeaway that Otto had. He looked around the room and he said, if I could get the old guard out of here, people will start to agree with me. And it was roughly this cutoff of about 60, 65 years old where the people that disagreed with him 
So he offered for people that had been serving in their version of Congress a retirement package for anybody who was 65 years or older and got that old guard out, got new, call it liberal, younger people to govern, and that was the first form of a pension that existed. Now, you fast forward to the early 1900s, and, and, and companies started wanting to do the same thing. The big company that had the first big nationwide pension was American Express. And American Express used the pension as a way to try to you know, keep people employed and to make sure that they didn't jump to other places. So in 1907, they launched the first pension, and they had to look for somebody else who had invented something, and they looked at Otto Van Bismarck and set their retirement date at American Express at 65 years old. Fast forward once more now to, 19, to the early 1930s, and we're specifically going to talk about 1935. What was the big historical event going on in the U.S. at that time? I'll, you guys are in the great what? Depression, right? In May 2008, looked like, uh, or, or 2020, looked like uh, a walk in the park. And FDR was dealing with 25% plus unemployment. And, you know, folks who were older, candidly, just becoming destitute, right? Red lines and everything else. So what was the solution? The solution was to get the same thing that happened with Otto, get some of the older folks out of the workforce, be able to replace them with younger, stronger, you know, uh, uh, stronger backed bodies, and to be able to provide some sort of a social safety net, some sort of security, some sort of social security, right? And that's where this idea of retirement came. And again, we see that same age of 65. I think this is fun, right? Because I, I don't know, you saw in the news today they, or this last week, they're talking about when Social Security is going to run out of money and it's like 2033, 2035. And we can talk about that some other time, certainly. Uh, but Social Security was a really good system. It was going to work out great. Because anybody want to guess what the average life expectancy was in 1935? It was 62. Congratulations on your negative three years of retirement. I hope you enjoy them, right? Uh, this is a program that's going to stay solvent for a long, long time. Fast forward to today, retirement, hopefully because of good financial advisors like the ones that you're working at, is now 63 is the average retirement age in the United States. And the average life expectancy is 79 years. Uh, in fact, you may have heard this statistic before, but for a couple that's re nearing retirement today, 60 years old, there's a 50-50 chance that one of them reaches 90. So all of a sudden, retirement planning has changed dramatically from a negative three-year approach to something that might last 10 or 20 or 30 years, right? If my wife does indeed get her pension in 19 years or whatever she's talking about, we'll be thinking about hopefully a 30 or 40-year retirement there as well. And that needs to reframe why we talk about retirement the way that we do. That's why we call this conversation the new retirementality is to think about it in a different way than our parents did, to, to get rid of this idea of the retirement day, the day that we get the gold watch being the end of the road, and rather this opportunity to just start a new journey. And if anybody has heard kind of the old Harvard studies in the past, the chance to write down what those goals are, to start to visualize them, because it becomes a heck of a lot more possible and probable that we're able to follow through with them. So what are the big three questions that we need to ask when it comes to our retirement? How do we frame where we wanna go? Um, and, and this is the point of this is that there are a lot of questions and a lot of different destinations that we'll all end up at, depending on how we answer those questions. Some of them may be in Iowa, some of them may be somewhere else. Some people may go back to work. In fact, uh, over 35% of all people who retire do go back to work in order to find a purpose. And there's a ton of questions that come up along the way. Oh, goodness gracious, along the way. Now, we've listed just a couple of them, and we're going to talk through all of these. We're not, right? But it starts to get really overwhelming really quickly when you think about how are we going to, you know, talk about coordinating spousal benefits? What about long-term care? What about being close to our family? What about Social Security? Can I take early retirement? What about my retirement, my early required minimum distributions? How am I going to coordinate my 401k and my SIPL and my SEP? How about all these different streams of income that we had? Things used to be simple, and now they get really, really complicated. So we've worked through some of those questions that a lot of financial uh, advisors have worked with their clients. In fact, unlike most of the other surveys and work that we do, this was not done with end advisors. It was done with retirees, those that somehow managed to kind of basket up whatever that energy was uh, that made them successful and really found that the three big things we want to ask is first, what is our retirement going to look like? How can we visualize what it is and where we're going? The second is when are we going to be able to be retired or when do we want to make sure that we have a retirement? And of course, 
what the folks here in this room do such a great job at is how am I going to be able to get there and how am I going to be able to fund it? So let's walk through here first with this idea of what is it going to look like. And again, people in our industry love to talk in threes. So let's talk about the three big questions that we need to make sure that we address. The first is location. Where is it going to be? The second is vocation. What are we going to do while we're there? And then the third, of course, is vacation. And we don't just mean traveling. Vacation from its very root just means what are we going to do once we're relieved of our duties? That's the Latin root word of vacation. Uh, and for us, conveniently, they all rhyme so that we can talk through this. Uh, and we are going to have at the end uh, these challenge cards. So we're going to go through some statistics. We're going to have some questions. But if your spouse, for example, uh, somebody else that you care about isn't here, uh, we'll have something that we can follow through. And I certainly encourage you to have those conversations here in general. So let's start with this first one, this idea of location. And, and what are the big questions that we're going to have to ask? I'm going to channel my inner clash here for a second, right? The big one is, should we stay or should we go now, right? Uh, if we stay, there will be trouble. If we go, there will be double, I guess, is how the rest of it goes. And I'm going to stop because these guys have never heard that song before. So uh, here's, here's what happens with the question of, should I stay or should I go? 75% uh, of retirees choose to stay where they are, which means 25% choose to move. Now, I'd argue that if you lived in Florida, those numbers might be different than if they lived in Iowa, right? Because there is one really big difference, and we'll talk about that here in a second. Here's the good news. Whether you stayed or whether you left, generally speaking, people were happy. 86% of those people who stayed were satisfied with the decision to stay, which means, of course, 14%. Uh, of those that we surveyed were not satisfied. Those that moved, the numbers were great. 96% of people were happy they got the hell out of Iowa. Excuse my language for everybody online. 4%, they were, they were not satisfied and they were ready to go home. But you know, a lot of people do fall in this. We did a survey, one of the people that we, we interviewed, they actually lived in Wheaton. If anybody knows where Wheaton is in Illinois, very similar climate, suburbs of Chicago. And their dream was to move to Carmel by the sea. Now that's a very expensive place in California, but it's also very, very remote. And they moved to Carmel by the sea and they realized that although there was great coffee shops and bookstores, they didn't know anybody there and their family wasn't there, right? So after 10 years, they sold their expensive house in Carmel by the sea and went right back to the winters of, uh, of Wheaton. Um, so that does happen. Not everybody's gonna be happy, but here's the questions that we wanna make sure that we answer in, in, when it comes to location. Uh, when we talk to people who moved, their biggest considerations, number one was of course that they wanted to stay close to their friends and family. Uh, number two was very similar, that they wanted to be sure they wanted to be familiar with where they were. Number three is that it, they maybe had paid off their house, right? How nice is it when you're not necessarily paying a mortgage anymore and they didn't want to take the financial responsibilities of another home or a seven and a half percent mortgage uh, today. And then the last one is, I think, something that's that, 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 you know, is a little sobering, but we all know is that you just have access to health care, right? Your doctors are here, your dentists are here, um, and, and we know where things are in general. Uh, for those who moved, what do you think the number one reason is that they moved? Yeah, better weather, exactly. So climate was the big one, right? 44% of people said they moved for better weather. Interestingly, number two was the same as number one for the other one is that it was close to friends and family. Uh, number three is that they wanted to find somewhere that was retiree friendly. And then uh, the fourth biggest one is that the, uh, the same thing we saw before was that they were moving from a high cost of living to a low cost of living conversation. So I know for all of you in this room, again, we've got little kids like this. So they, they, you know, when they move, they move from toy to toy. You may have had kids that have moved to a different city, a different state. Those things become big into consideration here in general. But when we start to talk about that weighing balance with location, it's a really important one because it does frame everything that happens beyond that. Now, some of you may have heard of the Franklin T-chart before, right? Ben Franklin, pros and cons. Here, should I, should I take a new job? Should I... Should I marry this girl? Um, we're going to use the, uh, the location L chart here just to talk in general about the pension points and be able to figure out what's most valuable and where we want to retire. And it really does come down to, and I promise this is not just specific to Iowa, it's for everybody, but how are we going to weigh where our family and friends are versus where we want to live from a climate perspective? And, and again, there's benefits to move into Florida, right? Less icy roads, less opportunities to slip. Uh, but do we have friends? Do we have family? Do we have a network around us? that's gonna make that successful in general. All right, so once we move from location, uh, let's start to talk about, I apologize, maybe I need to get a little bit closer here, uh, to vocation, right? What are we gonna do when we're there? And what are some of the questions that we can ask in general? Now, I got two little girls, uh, but we are fortunate enough that we still see pictures like this every day. Uh, and you may say, okay, this maybe seem a little off if we're talking about retirement, let's start to talk about babies, but I promise there's 
a reason for it. Um, uh, my daughter this week, she learned how to say the word ball for the first time, right? I mean, ba, ba. But for her, it was ball. And her eyes absolutely lit up when she knew that we recognized what she's saying. Because her vocabulary is like nine words, right? So that's a huge improvement for her. Um, there are other accomplishments that we have all the time. But for anybody who's been fortunate enough to have kids or grandkids and you see them take that first step to... You know, my daughter score her first goal, whatever it is, that accomplishment is essentially what drives us. And it doesn't go away when we're not kids, right? That sense of accomplishment is so important. How many people have seen a retiree, somebody who's retired, and all of a sudden it just seems like the lights got dimmed, right? Something has changed. They just slow down, they get sick. I mean, we have all of those analogies. We have those stories that we can rely on. And that's why, you know, this idea of dying with our boots on, you know, for the, 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 the baby boomer generation is a truism. We need to continue to find ways to be able to contribute. I said at the beginning, the goal of Social Security was never to get people who could continue to contribute out of the workforce. It was just to be able to expand the workforce. And that's, that's the mentality or the thought process that we have. So on your tables, there's a couple of kind of key slides that I took out of one of the brochures that we put together. One is this, is to start to talk about what your kind of play check would be. And it could, we say play check, we don't want you to think like you have to work if you don't want to work, but what are those things that we can continue to do to be able to find that vocation, to be able to find that purpose? Now, I ran through this with my wife in preparation for our conversation here today, and uh, she found out that she uh, wanted to become a Disney planner. Um, and I told her, no, you need to continue to work. But um, I look at these questions and I say, well, what do I like the most about what I do? Well, I love the conversations like we're having today, client, uh, you know, making sure that people are informed either around the market uh, or investments in general. You know, what do I like the least about my work? I have a tremendous amount of structure. I mean, I was in Omaha uh, two and a half hours ago. I'm, I'm headed to Sioux City, right? It's kind of crazy and it's tough with kids. Uh, you know, what is my current paycheck costing me and my family? I mean, clearly uh, it's time with our kids. It's making sure that we can have that balance. What is an ideal working scenario? As we walk through this, you know, what would somebody like me find as a great opportunity? Well, maybe it's financial education. Maybe it's an opportunity to be a teacher. You know, maybe it's, it's, it's something like that that could drive us in, in the kind of new economy that we have, the ability to be digital. If I was able to drop all my licenses and accreditation, it'd be a lot easier for me to give advice, right? So maybe in retirement, that's something. Maybe you've already done enough, Kurt. I mean, I get it that, that very much, but, but that might be what might drive me. My wife answers these same questions. And again, she wants to plan other families to go to Epcot. I think it's because she wants the discount. Uh, but uh, that's between you and I. So I think that exercise is a great one to go through. And just to start to ask ourselves some of those questions, what are those things in retirement that can start to drive us? All right. Uh, that comes down to this idea of purpose and passion. So again, as I mentioned, we didn't just come up with all of this in a black box when we talk about this concept or around being inspired to retire. Uh, and we did ask other successful retirees what they found. Most people used retirement as an opportunity to be able to plan and pursue hobbies. About half of folks uh, wanted to do sports. And I think this is important, and I may get back to this once or twice more, but this idea of you can't golf every day is, is, is real. Uh, and eventually we kind of run out of opportunities to do that. And of all of them, the one that had the least response was volunteer work. But interestingly, of the 41% of people who uh, did volunteer work in retirement, 88% of them said that they found real passion in that retirement work. Compared to sports, where 50% of people said that they wanted to pursue sports, only 46% of them saw that there was a contribution. So this idea of volunteering and giving back becomes really important. And again, we'd encourage you to think about ways that you can continue to be able to, to, to find organizations and groups because it's harder once you don't necessarily have that same network that we do at work before you retire. Again, here's the statistics I just mentioned. 86% of all people that were retired and volunteering said that it gave them a sense of purpose uh, versus 44% for hobbies and 46% for sports. So this chance to find ways to volunteer, to find those organizations that are important to us, do it now. Uh, do it now while we still have, have those connections. We're going to talk about this here for just a few minutes as well, which is kind of the vitamin C's of retirement. And I say that because when we talk about retirement and we talk about successful retirement and those individuals who were successful, uh, there are certain things that they seem that they've been able to bottle, that they've been able to find as an opportunity uh, to, to really validate what they're going through. The first is connectivity. 
Um, one of the folks that we interviewed in our, in our work called uh, Get Inspired to Retire was a literal rocket scientist and a professor. And it was very similar to that story I told you before that he uh, went into retirement and then started to see that things just dimmed a little bit, right? The, the same joie de vie. My French is as good as my Spanish, so hopefully we don't get into that here uh, just a couple days after Cinco de Mayo. But, but that had gone away. And after six months, what he found was the most important thing that he could do was to start to work with new associate professors at his university and let them ask questions about his past work, start to challenge things that he had thought of and worked through over his retirement. And ultimately, that led to him, a guy who had been looking forward to retiring for a long time, taking on a second career as an associate professor at the college. And I think, if I remember correctly, he continued to do that until his mid to late 80s, uh, because that is what kept him sharp and gave him that purpose. Uh, another individual uh, that we interviewed was 96, uh, and we asked her uh, what was her secrets to energy and retirement, and she said there were two big things. Number one was continuing to at least once a week having lunch with a young person, right? Because that spirit and that energy was so important. Number two was two ounces of Canada Club uh, whiskey every night. So, uh, you know, you take that as you need to in general. I don't know what your doctors would say about that, but I think it's an important one. Second one is challenge, right? What are we finding as those opportunities for us to be able to continue to challenge ourselves? Maybe it's physical. Uh, maybe, it's, uh, maybe it's a mental challenge, but are there those goals that we want to write down now to say, hey, I want to run a 5K, I want to run a half marathon, I want to run a marathon somewhere, do I want to kayak? Do I want to do it now while I can do those physical activities to make sure that we can stay engaged? The next is curiosity. And you know, we may have seen these stories before, right? The 75-year-old who decided that they wanted to go back to college. I'd argue that today, the opportunity to invest in ourselves, the opportunity to be financially curious has never been easier uh, than it is now because of technology and who knows what chat GPT will be teaching us next. But, you know, right now it could be the Khan Academy. If you guys have heard of that before is an opportunity for us to kind of take college level courses and take it to the next level. It could be Duolingo uh, as a chance to be able to learn how to pronounce uh, or whatever language it is that you want to challenge yourself. And that technology is so interesting, right? Because it finds ways that it can be specifically tailored to us to keep us engaged and to keep us learning. And then that learning process becomes very important. We talked about creativity and opportunity for us to invest in ourselves. I think when we did this last year, I think it was here, it may have been somewhere else, we were talking through uh, what somebody's goals were and somebody uh, kept coming back to an image that we had in our presentation of a, of a paintbrush. Uh, and they just said that they loved to paint when they were in their 20s and have never done it since. And they can't wait for an opportunity to paint again. And I think the question just came is like, what kept you, what, why aren't you doing that now? Right? Sometimes we talk about retirement and retirement planning and when we try to break those conversations into four key boxes. Uh, the first is, uh, are these things that we want to do today or that we want to do in the future? And are these things that are expensive? or in there are these things that are inexpensive, right? Expensive future goals, that's most of your conversations at Compass, right? Preparing for retirement, sending our kids to college. Uh, expensive short-term goals, uh, that's my car with 125,000 miles on it, right? I know that, that, that there's, I gotta make sure I have that emergency fund. But for the, the shorter-term low-cost low, low goals, if we go through that process and, and talk about what some of those key things are, like painting, like learning a new instrument, uh, what's keeping us from doing it? Is it time or is it something else? And then, of course, charity is so important, the opportunity to be able to give back either financially or to be able to big, give back with your time. I mean, we live in a world now where it feels like people are, are, are meaner and meaner, and there is more, there is more and more vitriol uh, around the world. If we have the opportunity to be able to contribute back, be it with education, be it with church, be it with whatever gives you that passion, it's incredibly important. But time and time again, these were the five characteristics, and they weren't for everybody but the five characteristics that made successful retirees successful and people that were, that felt like they had an opportunity to be able to contribute, to be able to contribute, to be able to connect with those people that they care about, to be able to continue to challenge themselves and an opportunity to grow, to stay curious, to stay creative, and of course, that opportunity to give back. So let's get to the last one here, and I know we'll have a few more things after we talk about this, but is this idea of vacation, right? This is the fun thing, and like I said before, vacation itself is not just a vacation to go somewhere else. That's important. That's fun, right? Uh, maybe you have a bucket list of places that you want to go to. 
my wife and I used to think it was so easy to go on vacations. We would go on vacations all the time. We would plan vacations with a couple weeks notice. And then there's these little monsters all of a sudden that have made things so much more difficult. Uh, but anyway, the, the whole idea of, of uh, where you are is going to frame what we mean when we talk about both what you're going to do, how you're going to be able to contribute, and where you're going to go, and what you're going to do in your free time. I mean, my folks, uh, they're from Chicago, and they're in the process of transitioning, sunsetting uh, uh, towards Florida, right? And when they go to Florida, their activities are very, very different. It's waiting for the grandkids to call. It is to go golf. It's water aerobics. It's walking the beach. I mean, these are all great things. When they're home, they have an opportunity. My dad serves on a bank board. He has a chance to kind of contribute back. They are two very different uh, areas. And again, we think that that's important when you start to weigh if it's going to be here or if it's going to be somewhere else uh, and to make sure that it doesn't get too far out of whack, right? We're not spending so much time continuing to work that we're not enjoying ourselves, but in the same way that we're not, you know, planning on not doing anything throughout our retirement. So really kind of keying up and focusing on that balance. Again, the statistic that we were going to share here is 52% of retirees, those successful retirees, actively make it a point to kind of balance out the life of, of making a contribution and, of course, finding that opportunity to, to give back to themselves, uh, to work, uh, have their money work for them as hard as they've been able to work for their money. All right, so travel is a big deal, and I think this is an interesting thing uh, just to frame when we do talk about vacation. 83% of all retirees prioritize uh, travel at one point or another in their retirement, 60 Two thirds of them have taken the time to kind of create that bucket list. Uh, you know, there's places we would love to go if we didn't have a two year old that we had to just hold one year old like that on a whole flight. Uh, uh, however, I will tell you that we find that many folks, when they hit retirement, uh, sometimes aren't as mobile to be able to climb Machu Picchu as they thought they were. Uh, in fact, a decent chunk of retirees, I believe the number, yeah, 19% said that in one way or another, their health. Uh, uh, prevented them from um, uh, doing all of the things, especially travel-wise, that they wanted to do in retirement. I'm sure, Guy, all you guys in the back of the room, you guys, Steve, you've done this before and you've seen that costs change throughout retirement, right? Sometimes the very first years of retirement can be the most expensive years in retirement because you use that as an opportunity to travel. Do it, right? Those are your go-go years. Then we go to our, you've heard that before, the slow-go years. And then hopefully we all make it to the no-go years. Uh, and our costs are going to change. Where we're spending money is going to change in those environments. But uh, if travel is important to you, uh, go ahead and do it and, and make sure that we can, we can plan for that as well. Write down uh, what those hobbies are. Again, uh, we talk about travel as a hobby. Hobbies in general, um, I keep making this joke about golf because my dad kept saying he was going to golf six days a week. And now he golfs one. 27% uh, of people who thought, and again, remember, 50% of folks uh, were those that, that thought sports or hobbies were going to be very important in retirement, a quarter of them just use it as a way to fill time, uh, right? Ultimately, are there other more attractive ways uh, that they could be fulfilling it? So the second one of those, second and third of those kind of pieces of paper on your table here are these, which is what will retirement look like? Behind that, you'll see a couple of charts here, which we would use to challenge you to start to think about how are we effectively going to fill our time in retirement? We did it in two different ways. The first is to basically break, break a week into 27 different segments, uh, morning, afternoon, and dinner, or morning, afternoon, and evening. How are we going to fit those, fill those 27 times? You know, which of those times are going to be filled with spending time with family? Which of those are going to be spent doing activities? Which are going to be times that we have an opportunity to be able to give back? Which are going to be times that we're going to watch the first six seasons of Game of Thrones? Uh, right. They, we, we have those different priorities that are there. But, you know, try this. It is hard to fit up 27 things when it's not work, 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 work for, you know, 20 of them uh, over the course of, of a day. The second is to start to look at our retirement almost from a financial perspective. And I know oftentimes in, in uh, uh, our business, we'll start to talk about financial accounting. Well, what if we start to talk about time accounting? Right? How if, what if we, we were to, to start to break our week down into the 168 hours that we have? And right now, 40, and I, I'd argue for many people, more than 40 of those hours are typically spent working. Right? That doesn't include commuting to work. It doesn't include doing my laundry for work. It doesn't include 
pre-work for, 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 for myself for days like today where we're doing stuff afterwards. What do we do when all of a sudden we get 40, 50, 60 hours back in our lives? Where are we going to invest that time? Right? Are we going to invest it in personal growth? Are we going to use it as an opportunity to have more health and wellness? Or are we going to use it to make sure that we watch the first six seasons of Game of Thrones? Right? So two different ways to kind of think through that from an accounting standpoint. And again, hopefully just engage ourselves, our spouses, and our partners in ways that we want to make sure that we are vacationing the lack of the responsibilities of those 40 hours in an effective and meaningful way. All right, so uh, if anybody ever like dreads paying their taxes, it's not that hard, right? But it's overwhelming, right? There is a lot of paperwork you gotta get together and the older you get, the more accounts and retirement accounts and hopefully dividends that are being paid out here. And I'm sure everybody in this office does a great job coordinating taxes, uh, but it is a headache. And that is why I have still not paid my 2023 taxes, uh, because we are dealing with all of the questions and getting all those pieces of paper together. The reality is retirement is way more confusing than your taxes. And there are so many dates that start to happen in retirement that we get information overload. Honestly, it keeps people like me in our industry employed. Uh, because it is an overwhelming amount of information we start to talk about all these dates. And they're all different and they're all changing. At 55, a lot of people don't know this. You can start taking money out of your 401k. you got to wait till 59 to take it out of your IRA. Uh, at 62, you've got Social Security benefits. But at 66, if you were born before 1960, 67, if you were born after 1960, 70 and a half. Now, 72 is when you can start to take contributions. 50 is when you can start to take long-term care and annuities. 80 is when you can run for president. The moral of the story is... <laughs> Uh, the moral of the story is there are too many dates that are out there and it can get so overwhelming so quickly. Now, the way we've dealt with this in our industry is to simplify it to two, which is candidly insanity. But if anybody ever has kind of heard of the, the, the concept of what's called like a, a certified financial planner, all you typically have to plan for, apparently there's only two days that matter, right? The day you send your kids to college and the day that you retire, that's it. Those are the only two things that we have to plan for. There's no other expenses. There's no other events. We know that that's not true. In fact, we worked with a gentleman, Mitch Anthony, uh, to come up with what we would call our retirement lifeline. And you'll see those on your desk as well. It's that same picture of the road that we keep showing in the background of these pictures as, as an opportunity to start to think about our financial plan, not just from a number standpoint, but now vertically. Uh, from a, a, a visual standpoint of all of the different dates that we need to plan for. And again, once we write things down, be them goals or expenses, it makes them a lot more likely for us to be able to fund them or be able to find them when it comes to retirement. So what are some of the other dates that matter? Well, I've mentioned a couple of times we've got two little girls. Somewhere 25 to 30 years from now, they're going to be asking daddy for a big check for a wedding, God willing, right? I mean, we need to plan for that. You know, there's a day we're going to pay off our mortgage in 16 years. That's an important date too, because all of a sudden we're going to have an extra couple thousand dollars that are coming into our household every single month that wasn't there before. That's important from our financial plan. Uh, we are now in our house for almost 10 years, right? Things are going to start to break. We're going to need to make sure that we can save some money for a water heater. You know, maybe in five years, we're going to need a new roof. Maybe in 20 years, we're going to need a new driveway. You, you mean, we all deal with those numbers and those are those are big questions. So on the right-hand side, we've got a couple of those key life dates to start to think about. Again, we could have probably put 40 of these down, and hopefully you can think of some of those as well. Uh, and then we've got money dates, right? Dates like the day that the average child goes to college, the average grandkid. Do you want to start to think about maybe leaving a, uh, a retirement account, not a retirement account, rather a um, uh, my what do I do? 5, 529. There we go. 529 for your grandkids. Have that conversation to be able to pass along that legacy. Uh, when is it that they want to fund that? Uh, and I'm sure everybody in the room would be happy to talk about 529s. But this is another tool, hopefully, to kind of walk away from it and take, take the time. Write down some of those dates. Write down some of those key uh, hurdles that we want to be able to jump over and also things that we can look forward to. Right? Uh, again, I keep talking about myself. We used to, we used to be so cool. Uh, my wife and I used to travel. We used to love to do stuff. And, and our goal was to get to 50 countries before we hit the age of 50 years old. It ain't happening, right? Uh, that's, unless Disney cruises go there, I don't think we're going to be able to get the same. So maybe now, maybe now our lifeline might be 60 by 60 or something like that, right? Uh, if we can write that down, 
we can write it, we're a lot more likely to be able to do it. And that gets us, I think, here in the last couple minutes that we have with this question of how am I going to be able to get there and, and how much money do I need? We haven't talked so much about, you remember those fidelity question, you know, uh, commercials where people would walk around with like $1.2684 million over their head, figuring out where those numbers are. Again, that's what these guys do really well is to be able to figure out and fund those plans. But if you haven't gone through the whole financial planning before, we've got another tool, which is the last page in that deck that I gave you that you can work through. Um, you guys know what this is? Anybody take psychology? Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? It's okay. I'm going to keep picking on you uh, until we get one right. Uh, uh, but anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm teasing. I, but if we look at this, this is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And, and where that history comes from is this idea in psychology that you have to fulfill the bottom part of the pyramid before you can move up. So if you can't eat and drink, it doesn't matter where you live. If you don't have a place to live, it doesn't matter if you have friends. If you don't have people that you can socialize, it doesn't matter if you like yourself or not, right? You got to kind of walk through that pyramid in order to, to build things up psychologically and then whatever self-actualization is is on the very top. The reality is we can see, and, and we've consistently, a couple times in the pictures, this has shown up, we've got the same pyramid that we can start to talk about from a financial planning standpoint. And again, what we're trying to do here is to be, move beyond just financial planning that is numbers driven, right? I need $4,212 a month and move to something that we would call holistic planning, goal-based planning, right? How can we look at the whole life and make sure that we are maximizing everything that we've worked for? Because the reality is it's easy to save money save money, like just put money away. And if the more money you put away, the more you'll have someday. The hard thing, I, you know, really, we make our money talking about making sure that that money lasts for us first. And then the second is that we're spending it on the right things. So when we talk about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we've got an example here that you can fill out yourself walking through this with that same kind of pyramid approach. The first is survival money, right? Let's take some time. Let's work through how much money we actually need just in food, clothing, potentially paying off our mortgage, depending on where things are. Then let's get to the what if money, right? That's where we start to talk about what happens if I, my, the radiator falls out of my car. Uh, that's still a thing, right? I'm not a big car guy, clearly. Uh, what happens if, if my roof collapses? What happens uh, if, if, uh, if we have medical expenses that come up? Then we get to the fun stuff, right? What about our freedom money? What are our goals? What are the things that we want to do? Is there a golf club membership? Is there a, is there a condo that we want to buy in Okoboji? Uh, is, there a, 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 is there Spanish lessons that we want to take in general? Then is the gift money, and I love that conversation about talking more about just our valuables and also our values, but how can we make sure that those things align and that we can pass it on either to our family or to organizations that we care about? And then what's the big goal, right? What's the dream money? Is it, is it a trip to Tahiti? Is it, is it a, a vacation in Aspen? Um, you know, it's interesting because when you actually work through this, it, it can add a little bit of credibility or a little bit of thought process uh, around whether or not we have enough to be able to retire. Now, this was a sample that we went through. And again, you can see our, our roots in uh, uh, the suburbs of Chicago can show through here a couple times. Uh, but this is one of the folks who helped us write this. And he actually did this with his mom uh, and dad. And, and their goal was um, uh, to travel the country uh, on an RV, like, you know, a motor vehicle. And uh, they went through the whole process and uh, realized that they didn't think about how expensive, they knew how much it cost to buy an RV. They knew how much it cost to eat, but they didn't think that, they kind of knew that they needed some gas, but they didn't think about how much it cost to park an RV, which I guess is really, really expensive. And then they realized that they didn't really like each other enough that they wanted to stay in the RV uh, all that often, right? So they had to go through this process to really identify is not just do we need the money for the gas, we need the money for the insurance, we still have to pay our other house, right? Because we need to go somewhere back to, and then we got to start to talk about all those campgrounds. So here's the example that we said, this one, the survival was $3,300 for survival, $2,000 a month away just to make sure that they can deal with the emergencies, $1,000 for freedom. And then you've got this opportunity. I think it used to be Tahiti is what we had up here. Obviously, we've updated it now uh, to Aspen, so I can't use all my Tahiti jokes. Uh, but uh, they were great, uh, Tahiti jokes. Uh, but that's that idea here in general. And as we, as we wrap up here, I, I, I do want to make sure that we at least talk you know, for a minute. And we're not going to sell anything or talk too much about the market. But the reality is it's, it's a crazy time, right? There is a million reasons. There are a million excuses today and in every generation that we have to not do the things that we promised to do, to not invest 
uh, to not necessarily have our money work for us. But the reality is we work damn hard for our money, right? I mean, I, I, I would ask you in this room if we didn't have so many people online to go around and, and how many years have you been working? When was your first job? Anybody think that they started working the youngest? When did you? <laughs> That's like, 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 like 10 years ago. Less. Anyway, so you're almost, you're almost there. I'll teach you about Social Security. It's 40 quarters of coverage. So you've got to make sure that they're being taxed on your nine-year-old income, right? Uh, but no, I think that's the thing is if you started working at nine and you're going to retire at 60, that's 51 years, right? That's a long time. It's scary. Uh, and it might be that you don't get to retire at 60 unless you come up with a strong financial plan. Anybody? No, I'm, I'm, I'm joking here. But there's a lot of issues today that we haven't dealt with in a long time. I mean, I remember when I started this, we would talk about like 17% CDs, right? And how people were, 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 weren't buying that because they could get 19% in their passbook. Not give me some 17% CDs. This stuff would be really easy now. There's a lot of similar headwinds today, right? There's inflation. The reality is everything gets more expensive all the time. You know, bread costs more, gas costs more, milk costs more, whatever it is. And oftentimes people have their money sitting in the bank. I've got my money in our home bank because my dad worked there. And I'm earning 0.01%. There's not a lot of money at the bank, <laughs> right? But the reality is, is that's criminal in the world that we live in today. And although the difference in a year might not sound that much to be able to get 1% or 5%, over time, it becomes really, really substantial. So these are just a very basic hypothetical on a $50,000 investment at 3% over the course uh, of five years. You can see it's, it's not a huge difference. It's a variation between 57 and 76,000. After 10 years, it's a pretty massive difference. And after 20 years, you can see the power of time, right? Einstein said the mo one of the most powerful forces in the universe was the force of compound interest. Theoretically, if I can get through the slides, We'll be able to see what compound interest looks like after 20 years. Ah, it was there. Did you guys see it? It was great. All right, here we go. Is I mean that's that's a really eye-opening figure, and the idea you guys can talk about it five, six, nine percent. I mean these are numbers that we want to make sure that your risks are commensurate, uh, or, or your with your goals. And we talked at the very beginning. Retirement has changed from negative three years to 19 to 20 to 30 years, and as a result, I think we need to rethink the way that we're taking risk. We need to rethink the way that we want to invest. And obviously, everyone in this room, you guys are working with a tremendous group of individuals that I've known for a long time, tremendous amount of faith that you guys are doing uh, the right thing. And I appreciate you, you inviting us to just start to ask more of those questions. Um, since then, uh, I promise that my, my wife is now a, a, a valuable member of our couples golf league. And she says that I'm, I'm the dead weight. And she's absolutely right uh, in the relationship. Uh, but I think we've learned a couple answers. Uh, I will open it up, speaking of questions here, but before I do, just in case I don't get a chance to talk again, uh, we'll pass these out at the end or leave them in the front. These are uh, really five-minute uh, challenges that you can do with your spouse, with friends, to kind of go through some of the key questions that we've talked about here today and a couple of the key statistics and numbers that we've shared. Uh, there's also some resources from uh, Social Security to, to books that we've written by Mitch Anthony. Uh, and other websites that, that you can leverage to try to answer a few of those questions. But I would challenge you is to find, especially within those, those five key questions, one or two of them that resonate, and just use it as an opportunity to kind of jump off and have some additional conversations around what can be a, a, a challenging, but obviously sometimes pretty fun topic. So with that guy, I appreciate it. I'll see if there's any other questions that we have. Yes, thank you. We actually have a special guest today. Oh, there we go. Uh, emeritus status, Kurt Pearson. If you all know Kurt, he is the founder of Compass, found Compass back in 1992. And the, as I'm listening through to all this, he is living it right now. And I just wanted to ask Kurt to come up here and talk a little bit about what he's learned in the process and you know, any advice from sitting on both sides of the table now. Well, definitely is a transition and so many of you have gone through it, and I've watched a lot of you go through it and countless others, but when you're going through it yourself, it's very different. And on the front end of the transition, I found um, a degree of sadness, things I needed to grieve as I let go of the career that had been a part of my life for over 30 years. 
And as I work now, I kind of see myself on the tail end of the transition. I don't have any um, strong sadness anymore. I've kind of worked through that grieving process. Um, so I think that's probably the normal course of how things go. I don't know. I, maybe I'm not normal, but that it seems it seems to fit. Um, you know, things happen like sometimes my wife and I will look at each other and we'll say, what day is it? <laughs> uh, because we get, there's nothing to necessarily define a week. And uh, we really like that, actually. Um, <laughs> you know, a change in my closet. I turned in the wing tips for Red Wings. Um, and I love that. And uh, getting, getting rid of dress shirts and I think I have two ties in my closet, and I'm not sure I need those, actually, so we'll see. But it is a transition, and in a transition, there usually is levels of grieving and moments of insecurity. As far as the numbers go, I have found that the advice I gave clients for years, um, when I'm feeling insecure about the numbers, about the finances, I dig into the numbers. I go deep into them. Of course, that's kind of my tendency anyway. And that really becomes therapeutic because I start mapping out, you know, um, cash flow. I start mapping out longevity. I start mapping out all the different details. And that I usually come out the other end of that and say, okay, you know, now I have a better sense of reality. And we can always deal with reality, can't we? It's when we choose to ignore reality that it can easily lead to dysfunction and uh, making decisions that maybe are a little dicey. So I have followed my own advice as well by not making any commitments. I'm about three months into this thing. And so I've had opportunities, hey, you should join this or do this or whatever. And now I'm going to give it a year, kind of um, let the experiment that I'm in kind of keep cooking and uh, see how I want to spend my time and, and all that. So is that excellent advice. Thanks, Kurt. Always welcome to come up and share your wisdom with us. Thank you. Questions? This is such a personal thing. I would recommend you take these things back with you and begin dreaming, begin talking. Uh, let your mind loose with some of these ideas and see how far it runs. Um, I want to thank you. The whole Compass team wants to thank you for your business, for your trust. Uh, if you know people that need to be cared for in the financial way or have a big question on the tip of their tongues, we would love to have that referral. That's how we grow our business. So thank you for coming today. Um, mingle around. We'll be here for a while and have a wonderful week. <laughs>